That was wonderful, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, good morning, church. Welcome to First Baptist Church, and uh, welcome to this uh, 4th of July Sunday. Uh, happy Independence Day today. Um, it's wonderful to be with you. And before we get started this morning, I've got a, a few announcements to run through uh, for us for some things that are coming up and some uh, fairly quickly here. Uh, first thing to say is that our women's ministry has a, a comedy night that's coming up. Uh, it's called Laugh Your Socks Off. And uh, come with crazy socks and bring an extra pair or two, uh, maybe to throw around or uh, <laughs> something like that. But you could bring a friend and a, a salad to share, and they're going to have a lot of fun with that. They're going to be uh, bringing in uh, Georgia Kelly, uh, who is a comedian that, that serves uh, all over the place. She has served in uh, comedy clubs in Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, Orange County. Uh, she's a single mom of four teenage daughters, too, so I... I feel for her. My, mine aren't teenagers yet, but uh, uh, to get you uh, a little acquainted with Georgia Kelly, I'm just going to show a very brief clip here uh, for that women's ministry comedy night uh, of one of her uh, uh, comedy. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so you would think that um, my house would be spotless with four Cinderella's living under one roof. <laughs> no, you buy them anything from the Apple store and one, two, three, A, B, C, they figure that stuff out, right? You introduce them to a dishwasher? <laughs> you want me to touch somebody else's dirty dishes? Uh, I, I don't know if any of you can relate to that at all, uh, but uh, that's coming up on July 17th, so it's coming up very quickly here, and uh, that'll be here uh, from 5 to 7 p.m. in our fellowship hall, uh, so be aware that that is coming up. Uh, also, we have uh, VBS that is coming. That's July 12th through 16th. That's just over a week away. Uh, we're going to be back to normal VBS without any uh, restrictions uh, this year, and we will uh, still need some volunteers. If you can help paint, if you want to help lead in VBS, you can uh, sign up for that in our uh, fellowship hall. Uh, you'll see a table with a lot of VBS stuff on it. You can uh, both register your kids and register yourself as a leader for that if you would like, and uh, we'd love to have you help serve that. This year, the VBS theme is all about uh, who is God, which just so happens to be our theme this morning in Sunday uh, sermons as well. Uh, also, this week, to get ready for VBS, the following week, on Thursday at 6 p.m., uh, we're asking all the leaders to come uh, for VBS preparations and training that we're going to have here in our fellowship hall, so don't miss that this Thursday. And uh, we're very much looking forward to having VBS after not having one for uh, basically, you know, two years now. So... That's coming up. Uh, also, the end of that week, on July 11th, uh, or I'm sorry, the beginning of that week, next Sunday, July 11th, uh, we're going to have an all-church uh, outdoor social that's going to be uh, here after worship services. We're going to have uh, free uh, food, uh, hot dogs to eat. We'll also have shaved ice uh, to keep us cool and lots of games and fun stuff to do. Uh, so that's coming up in just a week on Sunday. Uh, right before that, uh, we're going to have our business meeting, too, so just members be aware of that. We're going to have our um, quarterly business meeting uh, right after the service. And uh, then this week, too, deacons and deaconesses were meeting on Tuesday. The week uh, was pushed forward ahead uh, one week because of VBS, so just be aware of that this coming Tuesday. All right, so a lot of uh, fun stuff going on, a lot of wonderful things happening, and then uh, of course, we all have all of our different festivities for the 4th of July weekend uh, going on today. But as we come to the Lord in worship this morning, uh, would uh, you allow me to call us to worship with a passage of scripture from Psalm 105, verses 1 through 4 say this. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, 
Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord God, that's what we do this morning, uh, to seek you. On this 4th of July uh, weekend and this 4th of July today, uh, we also call one another in this country to seek you, Lord. Every Sunday, that is what we're here to do. And uh, this Sunday, Lord, it takes on a special significance for our country, a country that has turned away from you largely. Today, we call each other and a watching world to seek the Lord. And to know that as we seek you, we will be heard. We will find you. And this morning, we will hear you speak to us from your word. Bless us, Lord, as we seek you this morning. It is in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the, of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. Please stand as the worship team leads us in song this morning. and sing the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes, the wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Sounded forth the trumpet that shall never sound retreat. He is sending out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory. Of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free while God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah! Glory, glory, hallelujah! Glory.
dancing to the setting sun. His love endures forever, and by the grace of God we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us. standing for our scripture reading, and this morning, uh, one of our deaconesses, Laura Haston, is going to share scripture with us. We're going to be reading from two uh, different passages this morning. Uh, The first will be Isaiah 40, verses 12 through 17, and the second will be Revelation 21. Laura. measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge? and showed him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, 
He takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. Horizons, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength horizons, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong. first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Also he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. 
To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. You may be seated. Would you continue worship together with me now uh, in prayer this morning? Father God, we do come before you as the everlasting God the God who exists and rules beyond everything that we can understand or know, beyond every nation's beginning and end, beyond every one of our lives before time even began. And yet, you listen to us. You have focused your special care and attention on me. You have sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for me. You've sent your Holy Spirit to testify to each one of our hearts about the truth of who you are. You've given us an entire history that is recorded for us in scripture, that is your very words, full of life and hope and truth, that we, this, these temporary limited beings you've created, would, would stretch out and, and know you, would be able, even right now, Lord, to, to pray to you. You are an everlasting God, but you are a good and a gracious and a merciful God to us. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers this morning. Lord, we ask, um, first of all, that you would hear our thanksgiving. We have a great many things to thank you for, and on this 4th of July Sunday, we do want to thank you for uh, our country. We want to thank you for our local, state, and, and national leaders. We want to thank you for our um, servicemen and women. And Lord, we pray for all of them as you instruct us to pray for leaders in all positions, uh, low and high, that we might lead, lead and live a peaceful and quiet life, a life where we have freedom to do what we're doing right now, where we are able, Lord, to go from person to person, neighbor to neighbor, friend and colleague to share freely this message of salvation in Jesus Christ, to open your word and to make it clear to all those around us. And Lord, we pray that you would so move the hearts of those in leadership that they might be humbled before your word, that they might honor and respect the truths of who you are. And Lord, that this country might be taken back from the grip of so many that hate who you are, who deny your word. Lord, thank you for this country. But we ask that you would hear our prayers in revival and in deliverance. We pray too, Lord, as we recognize that our main mission is the Great Commission to see people come to Christ and hear the good news of the gospel. We thank you for those who are uh, giving their lives toward that service, uh, Lord, that we can share in their ministry in our prayers this morning. We think of our own pastor, Nick Gomez, our youth pastor. Um, Lord, would you give him continued wisdom 
and gospel teaching as he ministers to the youth of our church and our community. We think of missionaries we support like Brenda Lyons, who serves with missionaries on the field and, and encourages them in what is a very isolating and sometimes debilitating place of service as they, uh, the, min the uh, missionaries she uh, ministers to serves in the hardest reached places uh, in the 1040 window and typically the Muslim world. We think of, in our own community, in our denomination, we think of Pastor Mark Thompson, who serves at First Baptist Church in Kingsburg. Pray for uh, him and, and for that church that they would stand side by side with us in the proclaiming of your gospel this morning. We think, too, Lord, of, of the many requests that we have, that, Lord, we, uh, we recognize some are not able, as we are this morning, uh, to stand here and worship with us. Others, Lord, are beset with difficulties and trials, and Lord, we want to enter into that with them and uh, share the burdens, Lord, of our brothers and sisters in Christ. So, Lord, we ask that you would hear our prayers for uh, Sandra uh, Reimer, who broke her hip recently. She had a full hip replacement surgery last week, and she's recovering at Sierra View. Uh, Lord, please make that a full recovery. Give her, Lord, the, the patience, Lord, uh, as she deals with each day of, of uh, physical therapy and being away from her home. We, too, Lord, want to lift up Marilyn Roberts, who was hospitalized recently with a partially collapsed lung and fluid buildup. Lord, thank you that now she's home, but we pray, uh, Lord, once again that you would give her a full recovery. Uh, Lord, we pray, too, for Gail Friesen, who was diagnosed with glaucoma recently, and, and pray for a full healing and recovery there. We think of uh, Pastor Nick's um, sister-in-law, Maria Gomez, who lost her mother, and her funeral was yesterday. Lord, would you minister the hope of your gospel to this family? We, we also thank you, Lord, for the many ways you've answered prayers. We've been praying recently for... Um, Kristen's baby, the, the great-granddaughter of Linda Hamasaki, who had little chance of survival when she was born. Uh, she was given hours to live, but now she's home. She's made an incredible recovery, and we thank you for hearing our prayers for this precious little baby girl. We also pray for um, an acquaintance uh, of Laura and myself, who had a six-month-old son that had a, uh, an accident and a is on life support right now and also was only given very little chance to survive but is improving beyond what doctors expected. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. We've also been praying this week for Ken. He's a, uh, an acquaintance of David Turner in our church, and he was in the ICU this week in critical condition, but he's making a miraculous recovery too, and he may even be home already. Lord, we pray for Ken, and we pray for his salvation most of all that he would turn and embrace Christ through all of this. Lord, thank you once again for hearing our prayers. Thank you, Lord, for knitting our hearts together uh, as we thank you, Lord, at your throne and as we lay before your throne all of our requests, trusting your uh, everlasting will and goodness in hearing our prayers this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, the children can be dismissed if they would like to be for our uh, children's Sunday school classes. Uh, otherwise, they are more than welcome to stay with us too, but our children's ministry leaders will be ready to uh, receive them and take them upstairs at this time. We're going to continue worship, and we're going to do so in the giving of tithes and offerings this morning. And to prepare us for that, I'm going to read Psalm 50, a passage that we'll be covering in the message this morning as well. Verses 10 to 15 say this. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Let us now worship in the giving of tithes and offerings.
Thank you, Mary, once again. That was excellent. Having some technical difficulties this morning, you probably noticed there. Well, as we uh, begin this morning, we're going to continue our series on who is God. Uh, we started this, uh, this summer. We're making our way uh, through till the end of the uh, summer through August. And uh, this morning, I think what we can say is that we often find ourselves facing uh, difficult problems and challenges and frustrations that leave us exhausted. We either, we don't have enough time or enough energy or enough answers. There are just not enough hours in the day, uh, days in the week, months in the year. Uh, there's not enough drive in your heart or energy in your body, uh, intelligence or vision in your mind. You're facing a difficult project at work, a diffi difficult trial in a relationship, a difficult task in your life or a sin that seems impossible to get out from under. You may even be realizing that the years left in your life uh, are not many, and you feel helpless looking at all the things you wish you had done or, or know that you can't do, and you wish you only had a little more. We're very limited creatures. And faced with our own limitations, we ought to know we need more than ourselves to overcome these difficulties and these failures and these frustrations. And the Bible presents us with a God who is very unlike us. A God who has none of our limitations. A God who is in fact infinite and eternal. We're going to see both of these truths this morning as we answer the question, who is God? Uh, God is infinite, and God is eternal. So let's begin then with this point about God's infinity. God is infinite, measureless, boundless, limitless. God is infinite, measureless, boundless, and limitless. Now, when we come to a, a doctrine like this about God, we have to recognize that we can only begin to understand what God's infinity means by explaining what it cannot be or how it is different from the finite or the limited world that we inhabit. God's infinite nature is something we can never fully grasp because we ourselves will never be infinite. We will never experience infinity. So we're going to explore two truths related to uh, God being infinite that are very different from our limited world and our limited experience. The first truth is this, that God cannot be calculated, contained, or confined. God cannot be calculated, contained, or confined. We can start uh, this morning with the passage that we already read, that Laura read for us in Isaiah chapter 40. And what you'll notice there in verses 12 through 17 is that God is described as measuring the waters of the entire world in the hollow of his hand, as marking or measuring the heavens above, the, the, the sky, the universe, with the span of his hand, as uh, gathering up all of the dust, all of the dirt of the earth, and, and placing it on a scale, on a measure as weighing the mountains and hills on a scale, and all of them. God is described this way because he is beyond all of the limitations of this world. The question is then asked, who has measured the spirit of the Lord? What man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? Who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge? Who showed him the way of understanding? In other words, no one can know or add to the mind of God either. 
He is the supreme understanding and knowledge and wisdom of the universe. And this is because his understanding is infinite. A few other passages will make this picture that we see in Isaiah 40 more explicit. 1 Kings 8.27 says, Will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. Solomon here is speaking uh, about the dedication of the temple in Jerusalem. And he makes perhaps the clearest statement in scripture about the infinite nature of God. He, he cannot be contained in any created thing, whether that thing be in the earth or even in heaven. The heaven referred to here, it could be either both the, the universe, the sky, and the place where God del- dwells, the spiritual place where God dwells, or it may just be one of the two. Uh, but I think it, it actually refers to both. It refers both to the universe and to the spiritual heaven where God God's presence dwells. And this is fascinating because you have to understand that heaven cannot contain God. God is only manifesting his presence in heaven, but he cannot be contained even there. He exists beyond any created space. God actually lives nowhere. God exists beyond every place where he is active or where he might manifest his presence. He cannot be fully present in any one place because he would then not be somewhere else and therefore not be infinite. God cannot be contained, not even by heaven. Job 11 then combines these two passages that we've looked at Isaiah 40 and 1 Kings 8 by saying this, can can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol. What can you know? Its measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. The measure of God's understanding is beyond any measure in the created world. This is because there is no limit to the Almighty. He is measureless. Psalm 145, 3 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. So we might ask the question, why is God infinite? Well, Matthew 5, 48 gives us the answer when Jesus says, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now in this passage, Jesus is referring more to the moral perfection of God in relationship to us, but the same truth applies to all that God is. He is completely perfect. And if God is perfect, he must be without limitation, without fault, without weakness. If he had any of those things, he would cease to be God because he would have to admit that there is something greater than him, something stronger than him, something outside of him that he is less than. Therefore, God cannot be calculated, contained, or confined if he is to be the one and true God. Simply put, God simply is. Simply put, God is beyond. A.W. Tozer says it this way in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. He says, he is, beyo- he is above all this, outside of it, beyond it. Our concepts of measurement embrace mountains and men, atoms and stars, Gravity, energy, numbers, speed, but never God. We cannot speak of measure or amount or size or weight and at the same time be speaking of God. For these tell of degrees, and there are no degrees in God. All that he is, he is without growth or addition or development. Nothing in God is less or more or large or small. He is what he is in himself without qualifying thought or word. He is simply God. Matthew Barrett, in his book, None Greater, uh, summarizing and quoting Stephen Charnock, says, as the infinite one, he is an unbounded sea of being. An unbounded sea of being. Well, apart from a lot of quotes, this means a, a number of very practical things about God. The first thing is that God is invisible. 
cannot be seen. He cannot be touched or grasped. This means that we will never completely see God or fully be in his entire presence. It is impossible. Think of it this way. This is a close-up of the sun. And even though this is a close-up, if we were to put the earth in this picture, it would, be, it would be a speck, even at this distance. The sun is so large that it is beyond our comprehension. It, the sun is beyond our ability to see all of it. You can never look at the entirety of the sun because it is so large. You can only look at very small parts of it. In the same way, you can never see all of God because he is without size. He is beyond all measure. He is infinitely beyond our sun. The truth of God's infinity means that when we come to God, we come in humility before a God who is beyond us. We admit to the Father that we are infinitely inferior to him. We admit to the Son that we cannot fathom how he can be both infinite and incarnate. We admit Uh, to the spirit that we cannot control or manipulate or capture him. We bow before a boundless God. So God cannot be calculated, contained, or confined. This also leads us to the truth of our next point. And neither can God be exhausted, exceeded, or extinguished. God cannot be exhausted, exceeded, or extinguished. Back in Isaiah 40, but now in a verse we haven't read, we read this in verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Psalm 121.4 also says, Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither sleep nor slumber. God never grows tired. He always has energy, and he always has all of his energy. He's never exhausted, and he can never be exhausted. He never takes naps. He never takes breaks. He never stops his activity. He is constantly active. And all that God is, is limitless. A.W. Pink, in, in his book on the attributes of God says that his power is unabated, his wisdom undiminished, his holiness unsullied. The attributes of God can no more change, either for the greater or the lesser, than deity can cease to be. So if God cannot be exhausted, this means that he has nothing lacking in himself. He has no needs that must be fulfilled. uh, Fulfilled and certainly nothing that we could give to him. Again, reading Isaiah 40, Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. Psalm chapter 50 says, Every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills on all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world and its fullness are mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? He doesn't need those sacrifices. Finally, Acts 17 The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. These passages make very clear that God's inexhaustible and limitless nature means that God needs nothing from you. You have nothing to give to God that will add anything to him. Compared to God's infinite nature, you are less 
than nothing before him. You have nothing to offer God, and he is the one who has everything to offer you. We desperately need him, and it is not the other way around. And this God gives from an infinite supply within himself. Every one of his attributes, he has an infinite measure. Lamentations 3 says that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. This means that God's love is infinite. You cannot run out of it. You cannot test him beyond the measure of his love. If the Father has set his love on you in Jesus Christ, you cannot lose it. This is why Romans 8 tells us that I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you've been adopted by the Heavenly Father through faith in Jesus Christ, he will never run out of love for you. He will never say to you, I just don't love you anymore. I can't take it anymore. His love is infinite. So are some of his other attributes, well, all of his other attributes, but we'll focus on his holiness, his justice. They, too, are infinite. This is the only hope that we have that true justice will ever be served. God will call everything to account because he is able to and because uh, he must. No injustice will last or escape his justice. This also means, however, that we have transgressed a God who is infinitely holy and infinitely just. This means that our sins are much more severe than we could ever realize, and, and we stand condemned before this God. His holiness and his justice are infinite. But also his mercy is infinite. Though our sins are greater than we will ever really realize, as we cannot even remember all of them. No sin and no amount of sin can ever be described as beyond God's mercy. And we have to realize that God is merciful on this entire planet billions of times every second. And he has been, and he will be. His mercy does not run out. I don't measure up to his perfect standard. I never do. And yet I am still alive because he is infinite in mercy. As awful as your sins may be, they will never outdo God. And our sins can only ever be limited. They can never exhaust the limitless mercy of God. So God is infinite. He cannot be calculated or contained or confined, and neither can he be exhausted or exceeded or extinguished. You are completely dependent on him, and he has an infinite supply of himself to give to you. This truth of God's nature has implications on uh, all that, that our lives are, all that existence is, and it leads us into one of those implications we'll talk about this morning which is our second main point, that God is eternal. God is eternal, timeless, endless, changeless. Now, to make this point, we'll look at what this means for God's nature, but we'll also look at what this means for our eternity, God's eternal nature and our eternal life. First, and to, to state this point much more simply than the earlier ones, God is separate from time. God is separate from time. Genesis 1-1 reads, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Many have noted that this verse also includes the creation of time. For there to be a beginning point to the universe also assumes a beginning point of time. 
And though this is not explicit, perhaps, in this text, it's certainly confirmed by other scriptures. We can go to the end of the Bible, Revelation 1.8, and God describes himself as the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. Alpha and Omega, I'm sure you know, is the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, and God here says he is the beginning and the end. Note, he is not merely present at the beginning and the end. He is himself the beginning and the end, the source of time itself. God is eternal and has always existed, and this is bound up in his very name. It reminds us of what God said to Moses in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said, say to this people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. The very name of God, Yahweh, the unique name, encapsulates the God who always is, the God who eternally exists. He is the great I am. And the Hebrew words that translate these two um, words here are all variations of the, the Hebrew word for to be. God is being. He just is. He's the source of all being. He always is and he always will be. So God's eternal nature is apparent in his very name. We cannot say the Lord. We cannot say Yahweh without recognizing that he is the eternal God. But other passages bear this out too. Job 36 says, Behold, God is great and we know him not. The number of his years is unsearchable. Psalm 90 says that before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Psalm 102 says, Of old you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment, you will change them like a robe, and they will pass away, but you are the same, and your years have no end. Simply put, God is separate from time. And as God's infinity means that he cannot be contained in any created space, God's infinity also means that he cannot be contained within the space of time. Because God is not limited, he cannot be time. God holds an eternity of time in his hands, if you will, and he created it himself. He controls every minute of it, and he stands beyond it and outside of it. If you like, here's a, a very simple diagram. This is in uh, Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, and there's many others like it. But God is able to see all of time, uh, outside of time, at the same time. Uh, he is eternally present, and everything is eternally present to him. He sees the creation of Genesis 1, he sees the incarnation of Jesus Christ, and he sees the second coming of the kingdom of God all at the same time and for eternity. He sees the moment of your birth, he sees your childhood, he sees your entire adult life, and he sees your last breath all at once, all the time, for eternity. Uh, this kind of a truth holds myriad of implications for God and for us. It tells us that God's eternal nature means that God knows you better than you will ever know yourself. Better than you will ever know know yourself. He, he eternally knows about every moment of your life. He sees all your past moments more vividly than you see this moment. He sees all of your future moments more vividly than you experience this present moment. He knows our secrets. He knows our failures our successes, our lies, and our joys. He knows your deepest and darkest thoughts. He knows your weaknesses, your frustrations, your hurts, and your sins. This kind of a, of a knowledge of God on the positive side means that 
you are never alone. It is impossible for you to be alone. You can never be unnoticed by God. God can never lose sight of you for someone else or for something else. God will always know you. He will never forget your name. He'll never forget where you came from. He'll never lose sight of where you are headed. When I visit and pray with people uh, in the hospital or, or going through a difficult season of life or a surgery or something like that, I, I often, maybe more than anything else, I hear something like, you know, Pastor Rick, there are many more people with much bigger problems than me. And while I understand the reason for this, and, and I appreciate it because they don't want to just be uh, endlessly loathing their horrible position in life. They don't want to just complain to God constantly. On the other hand, my response is often to remind them of, of God's infinite and eternal nature by simply saying that God does not divide his time. He is just as present and attentive to your needs, whatever they are, as he is to anyone else's. He is just as present and as knowledgeable of your minor headaches as he is to someone on their deathbed. God is undivided in his time. He's never busy or overcome or distracted or spread thin. You can give your requests and your pains and your hurts and your difficulties fully to God because you know that he is eternal, because you know that he does not uh, ever have to be busy. He knows more than you can ever ask him. He knows more than you could ever tell him. And there's never too much that you can ask. However, there is a negative side to this eternal knowledge of God, and we must address it before ending this message. It's our last point this morning. God judges sinners with eternal death, and he saves believers in Christ with eternal life. God judges sinners with eternal death, and he saves believers in Christ with eternal life. The end of this timeline that we experience, the end of this stage in world history before the return of Christ, is pictured for us at the end of the Bible. We'll start in Revelation 20, where we have not read yet this morning. Verse 10 says this. The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The God who knows an eternity of time, he also knows all about our sins. And he will judge us according to what we have done and all that we have done. And the punishment does fit the crimes committed against an infinitely holy creator. It is an eternal one. All the dead who are judged are thrown into this lake of fire, which is an eternal hell. It is the same place that the devil was thrown. It's the same place where he will be tormented day and night forever and ever. What is a more pressing concern of your time 
than to know this warning. I know it's the 4th of July, but there's no more important subject for us to address this Sunday from this pulpit in this sanctuary or any Sunday than this difficult but eternal truth. This pulpit will always be used to bring this word of warning to you and to anyone else who comes through these doors. The sanctuary is a place of worship to the eternal God and proclamation of his eternal gospel. God strike me down if I do not read this to you. God is eternal and so is hell and you need to be saved from this faith. And God has provided a way. God has provided the way. The good news is that Revelation 20 is not where the story ends. In fact, the very next passage in the Bible in Revelation 21 says this that we've already read, but we'll read again this morning. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. How can I know that I can be one of those who are welcomed into this kingdom, this new Jerusalem? How can I know that I, I can be one of those who dwell with God and are numbered among his people? How can I know that I am one of those whose every tear will be wiped away by the hand of God himself and, and for whom death will be nothing but a distant memory? How can I know and, and how can I be one of those whom God calls his own son, his own daughter, and says so for eternity. For that answer, we need only go to the most quoted verse in all of Scripture, John 3, 16, as well as a few verses after. For God so loved the world with an eternal love that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish and perish eternally, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. God the Father sent his Son, Jesus Christ, into time, into the space of creation, to die on a cross bearing our eternal punishment for sin, being the only one who could do such a thing the only one who could give us such a hope, the only one who could cover for such a serious penalty. 
And Jesus did it. And he did it fully, completely, for everyone who believes. He calls on you today to trust him, to believe on his name, to know that you are saved and have been given eternal life and are escaping this eternal death, to know on this Independence Day that the greatest liberation you have received is the liberation that comes through eternal life of the infinite and eternal God who has loved you with an unfailing and an eternal love in the cross and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Believe in Jesus and know today that you are one of these people. You are a son of God. You are a daughter. And you have eternity awaiting you with him. God is infinite. He is measureless. He is boundless. He is limitless. He cannot be calculated, and he cannot be contained or confined. Neither can he be exhausted. Neither can he be exceeded or extinguished. This means also that he must be eternal. He must be separate from time without any uh, end or change or limitation on his nature. But the warning this morning and the promise is that this eternal God has an eternity of punishment prepared for those who refuse his son. And yet he has an eternity of life prepared for all those who simply call out to him in faith and know they are saved. Would you pray with me? Everlasting God. We confess, we come before you, and we hardly understand all that you are, what it means that you can be without bounds, without limits. Lord, would, would you humble us this morning with this truth? that we might never put ourselves before you, above you, that we might never doubt you, that we might never think that you're distant from us. We might never think that you can overcome our problems, and we might never think that our sins are too great for you. Humble us. And humble us to know the warning that is very real, that you have laid out clearly in all of Scripture, that I am not right with you. I have sinned, and my sin is greater than I understand. But Lord, help me also to know, to believe, that you do have boundless love and mercy and grace. And you demonstrated that fully for me in your son on the cross, your son resurrected. Lord, I, I believe this. Jesus is my Lord, my Savior. He is more than competent, more than capable, and his cross is more than able to wipe away every one of my sins. And I am truly free. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Revelation 21 was written for me. 
that I am in that book of life by your great, infinite grace. May I, may we spend the rest of our lives declaring this infinite wonder, this eternal glory of the salvation that you have given and the hope that is ahead for us. It is in your everlasting and eternal, wonderful, and glorious, and majestic name that we pray, Yahweh, the great I Am. Amen. Would you please stand as we prepare ourselves for taking communion together this morning? First Sunday of every month, we partake of communion together. I'd like to uh, share a passage of scripture from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, that declare to us the uh, great gospel that must be at the center of every one of our worship services and that communion guarantees will be. This is the simple gospel that we have been given. I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some has fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. May we apply that to ourselves this morning.
The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had broke it, he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, our Lord took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Please stand as I dismiss us this morning. Before I give the benediction and dismiss us, uh, please know that uh, every Communion Sunday we also have a uh, special deacon offering that is 
uh, provided uh, for those who are uh, in need in our church and outside of our church. Uh, if you are able and would like to give to that need, the deacons will be at the doors uh, on your way out, and you can give uh, there. We appreciate you giving in that way. A benediction comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thought of me above all.